Amen, amen, amen. You might have caught in that prayer that we're talking about conflict today. So this is your last chance to run for the doors. Everybody's still here, okay. Um, I want to start with a little story, a little bit lighthearted, um, but this one actually happened. Um, this was in Lawrenceville, Georgia. Um, there was an ER nurse um, in this hospital in Lawrenceville, Georgia, and, and his name is David Slagle. And he was there one night when this couple came in, and both were um, wounded, gunshot wounds, actually. Each one had been shot in the arm. And here's what happened. It's a husband and wife. And the way the story went is that the husband had woken up, for, woken up late for work that day um, because the alarm had not been set. And he expected his wife to set his alarm for him, which is weird. But anyway, it's not where the weirdness ends. She did not set the alarm, so he woke up late. He was late to his first day at work. He was so angry, he shot her in the arm. This actually happened. Not to be outdone, she went into the next room, got the shotgun, and she shot him in the arm. And so there they both are on separate stretchers in the middle of the ER. The deputy sheriff is between them, and they're handcuffed to the stretchers. And all of a sudden, the ER nurse hears the husband say, I love you, baby, and I'm so sorry I shot you. I have no idea if that was their accent, but it just seems right to me. And the wife responds to him, I love you too, baby, and I'm so sorry I shot you. The real miracle here is that this has not been turned into a country song yet. <laughs> but there is a million dollars out there for somebody who has the wisdom. Today's message is how to fight wisely and not end up in a country song. Amen? Or how to fight wisely out of the book of Proverbs. So we're going to go right to Proverbs chapter 26. And we're going to see what the Bible has for us today. Lots of verses all about conflict. And as we go into conflict, I want you to start thinking already. Some of you are turning to your Bibles and go ahead and do that. And that's awesome. There's going to be lots of notes to take. um, Lots of Proverbs that we're going to go through. Um, But you might want to start thinking right away of, God, in the area of conflict, where do I need to hear this message today? Where do I need to hear some challenge about conflict in my life? And for some of you, it might be a special relationship. It might be kids. It might be friends. Very first one, Proverbs 26, 20. And this one sets the stage for the entire rest of the message. Fire goes out without wood. And quarrels disappear when gossip stops. A quarrelsome person starts fights as easily as hot embers light charcoal or fire lights wood. You see the illustration here? You've got a fire, and the fire will keep going the more wood you throw on it. This is pretty basic. And it'll get bigger the more fuel you put onto it. But if you take the fuel away, the fire will stop. Very basic stuff. So the Bible comes in and says, the fire is like our fights, like our arguments. And if you remove gossip, the fire will die. Well, that's, that's a bit of a twist, isn't it? We didn't really expect gossip to be the thing. And we're going to look at a lot of things today in Proverbs that are like cans of gasoline you can throw on the fire or a wet blanket you can put on the fire. But this very first one that we're looking at, this is a can of gasoline putting gossip in there. Because why? Because the fire, the the fight, it doesn't stay just between the two of you nice and small. The more you gossip about it, the bigger the fire gets. It moves to other people. More people get involved. It's a party. Something you don't want for your fights, the next fight that you have, you don't want a party, amen? No parties, please. All right, so I'm going to start with a weird illustration. Um, And and just go with me. I'm going to connect the dots back. Um, When Linda and I were raising our babies, we read a book on how to raise babies. And In this book, it's not scripture, by the way. There's a lot of different books out there with lots of good advice. So this is the book we read with the advice that we read. And I'm giving lots of these disclaimers because some of you are going to be like, we didn't raise our babies like that, and that's fine. I'm not saying everybody should, but here's what we did. This book said, hey, when a baby wakes up in the middle of the night, 
The book, the, the baby needs to be soothed, needs to be comforted. Otherwise, the baby won't go back to sleep. And so if mom and dad go in every single time and hold the baby and rock the baby and put the baby back to sleep, then the baby will grow dependent on mom and dad to soothe it. And so for the rest of its life, when it wakes up in the middle of the night at 32 years old, it's going to need to call mom. We're laughing. Um, And so they said, what you need to do is let the baby soothe itself. And you can introduce your imagination into how that went. It was a whole thing. But if you can get through it, if you can teach that baby to soothe itself, you will make it strong and independent. And when it wakes up in the middle of the night, it can calm itself down, go back to sleep. And this applies to all kinds of areas of raising children. Do you teach it to be strong or dependent on you? It's a broad principle. But we've got to figure out how to soothe. We either soothe ourselves the right way or the wrong way. Follow me so far? Okay, so now let's go back to gossip, and then I'll connect it. Gossip is we're having a fight, and then I'm going to go and tell somebody else about it. That's the basic thing. We all know that. But how does it actually work? Let me break it down into four steps so that it can make sense to you. The very first step is that I get hurt by you, and when I get hurt by you, I have an issue now inside of me. It's emotional. I need to get it off my chest. Right, Because I'm struggling, and that stress and that hurt and that bitterness, i got to do something with it. It's right here. What am I going to do with it? Well, step two, I don't want to confront the person who hurt me. Why? Because that's hard. Amen? That's hard to go to the person and to tell them, like, this is why I'm struggling and you did this to me. That would be a way to process the hurt and the emotion that I'm feeling, but I don't want to do it because it's confrontational. We don't like conflict. Step number three, so what I end up doing is I explain my hurt to another person, and then miraculously, I feel better. We've done that. Like, we give it to somebody else, and now it's off my chest. (sighs) Ah, I feel better. But then step four happens. Now the person that I told has an issue. Don't they? Because I handed it to them, and I feel better But now they're over here stewing like, boy, I don't know if I respect that person the way that I used to. I don't know know that I like the fact that they did that thing to Josh the way that they did. And now they've got a thing that they're holding. And by the way, they don't have an interaction with me, so they've got no way to resolve it. They're kind of trapped in a way. And then here's what happens. Then they need to get it off their chest. Then they don't want to confront the original person. Then they have to explain their hurt to yet another person, and the fire goes wider and wider and wider, rinse and repeat. Some of you grew up in families where this wasn't the exception. This was the rule. This is how we do it. So I was in a friend group once, and in this friend group, there was a lady there, and she had this boyfriend. Boyfriend's name was Dwayne. And say Dwayne right now, but kind of growl when you say it, Dwayne. Dwayne. Um, so she had this boyfriend, Dwayne, and she would come to the friend group and she would tell us what was going on with Dwayne. And when things were good, things were really, really good. But when things were bad, she would tell us all the bad. And we would hear all the bad and you just kind of like Dwayne, you know, you just kind of hated Dwayne. And, and there was this one guy in our friend group and I noticed it's like he especially growled when he would say Dwayne. He really didn't like the way that he was treating her in our friend group. And, and, and she would then, after a while, she would, she would kind of reconcile with Dwayne and everything would be rosy again. And she would expect to come back into the friend group and everybody loved the idea of Dwayne. But this guy over here couldn't because she had told him too much. And he had heard these things. And the problem is, is that she took all of her issues back to poor Dwayne. And she dealt with all the issues with poor Dwayne. And they had reconciled. But this guy couldn't reconcile. He had no relationship with Dwayne. Am I making sense today? And so Timothy Keller, pastor, he calls this twice removed baggage. When we gossip or we receive gossip from other people, what we've got here is we've got twice removed baggage. It's baggage that I can't deal with. 
And it's also baggage that let you off the hook and you're not going to reconcile with the person because you sort of feel better. We build patterns in our lives just like those babies when they wake up in the middle of the night. And many of us were taught a pattern at a young age and some of it was in our families and some of it was in our churches. Some of us were taught that when I have an issue and I don't know how to resolve it, I don't go to the person, I go to somebody else and that's how I feel better and that's the way I'm soothed. And so we're stuck in the pattern even into our adulthood. And Jesus wants us to have a different pattern. And here it is, Matthew 18, 15. Some of you guys knew I was going after this. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. And if they listen, you have won them over. Now, break, break down what Jesus is saying. He says, if, if they hurt you, you have to go to them. This is a high courage, direct conversation. Amen. This isn't, a, this isn't just a fun time on a day off. This is a hard conversation to have. And Jesus is saying, this is the way to do it. And if you can learn this new pattern, it's going to be brutal in the beginning. It's going to be very heavy, but it's going to be worth it. And the more you do it, the easier it's going to get. This becomes the pattern in your life. This is what I do to deal with the issues that I have. So I go to them. I don't text them. Somebody say Amen. Come on. I don't text them. No, I go. Just the two of you. I don't take a party. Just the two of you. He's so specific, isn't he? Jesus brings life, and Jesus brings healing, and Jesus brings salvation. And a lot of us were taught that when we say Jesus brings salvation, we think about heaven. How about salvation into our relationships? Jesus' words are life and they are eternal. He's brilliant. Because if we would do this, and if we would learn to soothe our hurts this way through high-cost direct conversations with people, imagine the health and healing. And if they listen to you, you've won them over. And it's an if. And some of us are, we're nervous about that if. But they might not. And And we might not reconcile. We might not see eye to eye. And that's all true because the Bible's honest with us. But what's happened, even if you do it, even if if they don't agree with you, even if you can't reconcile, you've still walked a healthy path, amen? Because you didn't broaden it. You didn't make the fire go bigger. You limited it right down here between you and God and the other person. It stayed nice and small. Plus now they know. Plus now they know. And maybe after a few weeks or a few months or a few years, they might finally see sense because you've told them the truth. And good things can happen. So don't avoid it. Go to the person alone. Jesus knows what the heck Jesus is talking about. Amen. Amen. Trust him. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust you. Anybody know that old song? How I've proved him o'er and o'er. Trust him. Soothe the pain. So our conflicts are like fires. It's like, will we put wood on the fire? Will we put gasoline on the fire? Will we put a a wet blanket on the fire? What are we going to do? And what conflicts are you thinking about right now? So the very first thing was um, gossip is like a gasoline can. The second thing that's also a gasoline can on all your conflicts in your life, because we've all got them, Proverbs 26, 17. Whoever meddles in a quarrel, not his own, is like one who takes a passing dog by the ears. This is one of many pictures in the book of Proverbs today, and this one I find particularly hilarious. It's like taking a passing dog by the ears. Now, why is the dog passing? Because it's not bothering you. It's on its way to somewhere else. So don't get involved in a thing that's not your own. This proverb is saying, mind your own business. If you're taking notes today, mind your own business. Don't jump into another person's conflict. You've got enough problems of your own. But we do this. We do this. I've got a, I've got a special dog here for you on the slide. There he is. I'm personally allergic to dogs, so this, this is the closest thing I'll ever have to my dog. Here's my dog. Why would you grab this dog by the ears? 
<laughs> it was walking along and not bothering you. And if you grab this dog by the ears, what are you going to get? Angry teeth in your face, right? So you see what the, you see what the ancient words are trying to say to you? There's fights over here. They were leaving you alone. If you grab those things, you've got enough trouble of your own. You're going to have angry teeth in your face. Don't have angry teeth in your face. There was a time when a family member of mine posted something on social media, and it hurt the feelings of another family member. And some of the other family kind of got involved, and they called me up. You see where this is going? Josh, you've got to reach out to them. You've, you've got to tell them what they did wasn't right. You've got to ask them to take that down. And then I had a moment of absolute stupidity. Anybody ever experienced the gift of spiritual dumbness? Oh, my goodness. And I took that challenge, and I got myself involved, and I reached out to the family member that had made the post and tried to explain why they shouldn't have done it, and blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden, I had angry teeth right in my face. What are you doing here? It's not your business. And I look back at that story, and I'm like, why did I do that? Like, why did I give in to that? Was I not busy enough that week? No. I think what started to spin in my mind was, well, you know, you're a pastor in this family. Maybe it's somehow your job to jump in and do things like this. Do you hear the ego in those words? Our pride is so subtle. And I talked myself into it. And by the grace of God, I'll never do it again. <laughs> Amen. Proverbs 18, 19 is the next one. If you offend friends, then you will lose them. An offended or a betrayed friend, Proverbs 18, 19, is harder to win back than a fortified city. Arguments separate friends like a gate locked with bars. Sometimes we hurt friends because we're careless. We hurt friends and then we lose those friends. And the proverb is just, it's hitting us with this life truth of once you've lost a friend through betrayal like this, it's very hard to get them back. And so be careful on the front end. A lot of what Proverbs is going to say to us today is be very, very careful on the front end that you don't get something started, that you don't introduce the hurt. And I, I love the, the, the second part of that. It says arguments separate friends like a gate locked with bars. And some of us have been on the other side of that. We've said things like, like this to ourselves. I'll never let that person do that to me again. You ever say that to yourself? And what have you done? You've put up a wall of bars between you and them. And this is what we do. We often, we, we, we hurt each other. We don't resolve it. We're reckless with what we do. And we, we end up building barriers between each other. And, and you and our relationships do. Our, our relationships separate. And they stay broken. And Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Next one, believe your motives are always right. Proverbs 16, 2. This is for a different church, not for us. No one else has this problem, <laughs> right? People may be pure in their own eyes, but the Lord examines their motives. Don't be so quick if you're in the middle of a fight to believe that your motives in the fight are right. I only wanted to help you. I only ever, really? Really? Is there no, no room or space here except for you to be a completely righteous person in this argument? Because that's a hard argument to have. If you got to be right and perfect, whew, it's tough. I've done it. I've been right there. Jesus said, what about the plank in your own eye? Why are you worried about the speck in your brother's eye when you've got a plank in your own eye? He doesn't say if you've got a plank in your own eye. Did you notice that? He says when you've got a plank in your own eye. He assumes it's there because the Lord examines our motives. And when we come out of the examination, we don't do so well. 
Paul said in the book of, of uh, Romans, he says, even when I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Take that in for a second. Even when I want to do the right thing, I'm having a good day. Evil is right there with me. Why? I don't know. Maybe I had a tone. Not you guys, just me. Maybe I had a tone. She told me I had a tone. I didn't say it in the right way. didn't use the right words. I didn't encourage before I brought the criticism and then encourage again. You know the sandwich. You know all about that. Like that's how we should do those things. And you don't use words like just like your mother. You don't do things like that. All those things that we shouldn't do. And my motives were so pure though, but were they? Because the apostle Paul himself said, even when I want to do good, evil is right there with me. That that's, we kind of muck everything up. And Proverbs comes in and says the same thing. Maybe you shouldn't be pure in your own eyes. Maybe motives shouldn't be tested by you. Maybe they should be tested by the Lord. Maybe you should walk into your relationships with some humility Sometimes people come to me and they're like, Pastor, you say we should pray a lot and I should be praying on a daily basis, but I don't know what to pray. Tell me what I should pray because I don't know what to pray. You know what should be near the top of your list of things to pray on a regular basis? Is, Lord, where were my motives wrong? Because I'm having this conflict with my spouse right now or with my kids right now, and I can't see it. You know how many times I've prayed that? God, I can't see it. She t- she's telling me I'm a blockhead right now, but I can't see it. Would you help me see what it is that I'm doing? And you know what? The Lord always seems to answer that prayer for me. Always. He's got things to say to me. It's a great prayer. Next, enjoy the fights. So this is gasoline we pour on the fire of our fights is that some of us enjoy it. Some of us enjoy the battle. We enjoy the conflict. You know who you are today. Whoever loves a quarrel, Proverbs 17, 19, loves sin. And whoever builds a high gate invites destruction. That sounds silly on the surface. What do you mean? They like the quarrel. Some of us are good at debating. Some of us are really good at arguing and winning at the end. It's not the quarrel that we enjoy. We like the win. Again, nobody in this room, I know, just me. Some of us like the win. And why do we like the win? Because the win makes us feel big and it makes us feel strong. Um, Let's get really real with our egos here for a second. For a lot of us, it feels like a whole lot of our life is out of control. And there's a whole lot of our context where we feel really small. And so if we come into this one space where we feel like we can win the arguments, we feel big at the end, and that's a nice feeling. Don't love fights. Don't love fights. Look at the second half of that. Whoever builds a high gate invites destruction. Weird phrase. I was reading a commentary on that one. What does it mean, build a high gate invites destruction? Or like in ancient times, sometimes people didn't have a very big house. And what they would do is they would build a really high wall and a high gate around a really small house. Because that communicates to you the house is probably big too. It's an illusion of bigness. Sometimes we like fights because we like the illusion of bigness. This Proverbs has some things to say to us today. Don't pour gasoline on the fire. Next is mock and insult people. Proverbs 22.10, drive out the mocker and out goes strife. Quarrels and insults are ending. Mocking divides. Mocking has this way when you've got somebody in your friend group and they're the mocker, what you do is you end up turning people into caricatures of good guys and bad guys and use insults that are like, they're, they're almost cartoonish, right? It's like, no, it's not good guys and bad guys. It's, it's all broken people trying to find peace together. That's what it should be. Next, Bring conflict into your home. That also pours gasoline on the fire is don't dare bring it into your house, not intentionally. Those who bring trouble on their families inherit the wind. 
Proverbs 11.29. Isn't that big? It's, you almost imagine the picture of a, the reading of the will. And you walk into the reading of the will and parents have passed away and what have they left me? Wind. What does wind mean? Nothing. That you've, you've, you've gone this whole time and you've got nothing. Those who bring trouble into their home inherit wind. Whew. Proverbs 24, 29. Get revenge and then the fire will never stop. Don't say, now I can pay them back for what they've done to me. I'll get even with them. Just a quick word about revenge because revenge is all the way through the scripture. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, declares the Lord. You remember that passage? We're not, we're not supposed to go after revenge. Revenge absolutely pours gasoline on the fire. It will never, ever end because once you get your revenge, they'll want revenge back. It's not peace. So let's get on to some better thoughts. How about the wet blankets that put the fire out? Proverbs 20, verse 3 says, avoid the fight. Avoiding a fight is a mark of honor. Only fools insist on quarreling. Avoid a fight. Man, that sounds so passive, doesn't it? A lot of these are going to sound passive to you, but they're absolutely brilliant. Avoid a fight. See, people come up to you and they're like, did you hear what they said about you? What are you going to do about that? Are you just going to let them get away with that? People say things like this, right? Are you going to take a stand about this thing? And you know what they're doing. That's the voice of the world, right? They're coming to you and they're saying, your manhood is on the line. Your womanhood is on the line. Are you a strong person? Are you a respectable person? Because if you are, they just threw the first punch. Are you going to let that stand? This is the way the world thinks. Proverbs comes in and says, avoid a fight. Put it to bed. All the fights that we could have avoided there's a prophecy in the book of Isaiah about Jesus talking about him coming before his accusers. And it says, like a lamb before the shears is silent, so Jesus would not defend himself against his attackers. He avoided the fight. That's our Lord. Amen. Ignore an insult. Proverbs 12, 16. The vexation of a fool is known at once, but the prudent ignores an insult. The same kind of thing, right? Things come after you. Can you let it go? Can you simply ignore it and let it go? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words, come on, will never hurt me. And we know that's a lie. We know words absolutely hurt us. But sometimes we swing the pendulum over to like every single word must hurt us and we must fight back. How about sticks and stones may break my bones, but words don't necessarily have to hurt me today. Not necessarily. And there are some words that I could just, I'm going to ignore that. Next, Proverbs 13, 3. Just don't talk. Those who control their tongue will have a long life. Opening your mouth can ruin everything. Did Proverbs just tell me to shut up? I don't mean me personally. We don't say shut up in our family. Proverbs just said it. It just said, shut your mouth. In a lot of these situations, could we just be silent? And if we could just be silent, we would throw a wet blanket on everything that's happening. Some of us just need to stay quiet. Next, drop the issue, Proverbs 17, 14. Starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam. It's like you don't even want to get this started. So drop the matter before a dispute brings out. In our homes, this is just so, so big. You might remember Jesus talked one time about people who were having an argument and they were on the way to the judge. Do you remember that particular one? And he says, fix it before you get to the judge, before you get to the court hearing. He says, if you can make an agreement before you get there, it's so much better because once you get to the judge, it's done. And that judge is going to come out with a consequence. And, and, and then it's locked in. You may really, really hate that whole situation. So Jesus is like, get a plea deal, basically. Deal with it. And that's what the proverb is saying here. 
It's saying drop the matter before the dispute really gets going. In our homes, this is big. Just, could I just give you some advice? Drop it. There's a lot of stuff in, in your family right now. Can you drop it? Like 95% of it, can you drop it? As a pastor, one of the things that I experience is I go to a lot of funerals. And I talk to a lot of people who've lost a loved one. And you know one of the things I consistently hear is, man, I just, I made such a big deal out of small stuff. And now that I've lost them, I wish I could have the time back. I wish I could do these things differently. I wish I could have seen the big stuff and known what the big stuff was and the small stuff and known what the small stuff was. And 95% of our stuff, like who has washed the dishes the most this week? For the love of God, drop it. Just drop it. Who, who comes home from work earlier or, or late or how, how often, how late and all that kind of stuff and who's better at it? Just drop it. There's so much stuff. Parents, drop it. Focus on the bigger things. Drop 95% of it. Make most of it into that bucket. And then save about 5% of it and say, we're really going to work hard at understanding each other, finding healing, and resolving these things, these things, these priority things. But your voice in the home, if you prioritize in that way and say, you know what, I'm an easygoing dad. I let a lot of things go. So when I show up and I say, we have to deal with this, how much louder do you think my voice is in authority? How much more do people trust me? Because I save it for the most important things. And I'm talking as if I'm good at this and I'm not. But we need to do that. Drop so much of it. And here's just a, here's just a little thing if this is confusing you. I'm not talking about sweeping things under the rug. I'm not talking about dropping things that are going to lead to bitterness and lead to real, real infection in the relationship. Um, so something I talk about sometimes is the, what I call the Band-Aid test. You know, when we were kids and you got a scrape on your arm, you put a Superman Band-Aid on it, amen? And everything was great. And what's the Band-Aid doing? Mostly what the Band-Aid is doing is just not letting you see the blood, right? And you leave it on there, and then you go a few days, and once you take the Band-Aid off, if everything's healing nicely, the Band-Aid was functional. Great. But if you pull the Band-Aid off, and there's infection, and starting to swell, and starting to get more and more red, then you got to deal with it. Maybe it's hydrogen peroxide, right? Maybe it's alcohol. Maybe it's, maybe it's I got to go to um, prompt care, or something like that. Like, you've got to take the next step to deal with it. It's the Band-Aid test. Same thing in your relationship. Drop it. And if all heals, and if everything goes forward, and you're fine, you know what you're going to feel con confirmed in? Oh, I'm so thankful I didn't make a big deal about that. But if you check it later on, and it's like, nope, I can't let this one go. This one's leading to bitterness, and it's leading to bad things in the relationship. Then advance to the next steps. Maybe get a counselor, have a conversation, all that kind of stuff. Next is talk softly to an angry person, Proverbs 15.1. A gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. This is another wet blanket to put on the fire of your fights. If you've got anger in the home, some of you guys have had this experience before where someone gets really angry, and then you respond with anger. And it's not necessarily revenge, but in that moment, as you respond with anger, they respond with more anger, and it gets louder and louder and louder, and it doesn't work. Proverbs is just coming in with some really practical advice here and says, answer softly. You see anger and things are loud, you be the soft one in the room. You be the patient one in the room. You be the one who slides in some suggestions. And, and, and just watch what happens to the temperature. Some of you guys have done that before. Next is cover an offense. Proverbs 17, 9. Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. I love this one. Um, 
Again, this isn't, this isn't sweeping things under the rug like I, I want to avoid it or not deal with it. This is covering an offense. It's, 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 it's very, very different. And, and notice the motive it says there. If you cover an offense, it's because you're seeking love. It's because you're seeking for the relationship to go deeper. You're not just wanting to coexist with this person. You're not just wanting to like be not enemies with this person. It's no, I want a deeper friendship with this person, so I'm going to cover this thing that happened. I'm not going to necessarily blow it up every single time. There's, a, there's an old Bible story with Noah, and you guys know Noah and the ark and the flood and all that kind of stuff. There's a little footnote after they get off the ark that they didn't teach you in Sunday school. Do you know what it, what it, what it is here? Noah got drunk. They came off the ark. It's a weird little story. And Noah gets drunk. And you kind of don't know why. It doesn't explain it. Some scholars come in and they're like, well, maybe wine didn't ferment after the flood like it did before the flood and all this kind of stuff. Who knows? It's all guesswork. All we know is the guy got drunk. And he got drunk and, um, and he was in his tent. He was naked on his bed. That's your Bible. It says that. <laughs> and so he's got three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And one of them, I don't remember, I don't remember which ones did what, but one of them walked into the tent and saw dad passed out naked. It was like, well, this is weird. And he decides to do this thing where he walks out to the other two brothers and he's like, let me tell you about what dad's doing. And the other two are like, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to have a laugh. And what the other two do is they grab this big sheet and they walk backwards into the tent so as to not look on their father. And they drop the sheet over their naked dad on the bed. And they're covering his nakedness. They're covering his shame. Do you see it? It's not about physical coverage. It's about the fact that they decided in that moment of his weakness to protect his reputation. And when family is doing that for each other, do you think we earn points with each other? When we do that kind of thing for each other, what do you think that does to our relationships, even where there's broken stuff around? Man, man, you loved me there. Isn't that a big deal? In the New Testament says, love covers over a multitude of sins. We're told in the scripture that Jesus' blood covers our sins. Do you see the picture it's using here? So we didn't deserve it, and our shame was out there, and it got covered by someone who loves us. So good. Next, be humble and bring peace, Proverbs 16, 7. When people's lives please the Lord, even their enemies are at peace with them. Even their enemies are at peace with them. It's hard to even imagine, right, to, to live a life where even your enemies are at peace with you, but that's the promise that's given here. And you're like, well, my spouse isn't an enemy, hopefully, my kids aren't my enemies, hopefully. But if my enemies are at peace with me, then shouldn't all of them be as well? Then I, I look at the verse again, and I'm like, well, then how do I get this? Because this is what I want. How do I get this kind of a wet blanket? Well, it says, the person who pleases the Lord. Well, what kind of pleasing the Lord are we talking about here? I think the answer is humility. Humility. I think the answer, just in the context of all of this, I believe it's humility. Jesus says this. This is Luke chapter 6, verse 27 through 28. Jesus' words. But to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who hurt you. Can you hear those words through the context of this whole sermon, of all this thinking that we've been doing about conflict, and here comes Jesus. And what's he advocating for? He's advocating for deep humility in us. He's like, people are going to be your enemies. They're going to hate you. They're going to curse you. They're going to hurt you. Oh, my goodness. And those are the people that need your love the most. Those are the people that you can be a true peacekeeper with. Blessed are the peace peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. And he gives us steps to make peace with them. And he could have made this so basic, but he doesn't. 
what we expect Jesus to say is somebody hurts you and there's a brokenness, there's an argument, I want you to forgive them, done. Say you're sorry, forgive them, done. He doesn't do that. He goes deeper. And he says, no, I don't want you to do that because too many Christians say that. We just say the words that we forgave somebody and then we're done and then we've got this lingering bitterness, this slow simmering underneath the surface, undercurrent of frustration, hurt, never lets go. Come on, Christians. Is this us? We so often say the words and then we don't have the heart follow up there. And so what does our Savior do to bring sanity to our insanity as the Savior comes in and says, I want you to proactively do some things for these people. I want you to speak blessings over them. I want you to do good for them. I want you to serve them. I want you to love them, and I want you to pray for them. I hate Bob. Jesus, I'm not going to do that. What do you mean pray for them? Let me pray for them. Oh, God, be with Bob, that guy I hate. Oh, God. How's that prayer go? Jesus is calling us to so much more here. It's the path of healing. Here's some habits of personal forgiveness I would uh, see in Jesus' words here. Number one, don't make them pay for what they did to you. We all want them to pay. Decide they're not going to pay. Don't make them pay. Don't drag up the past ever with them. Don't demand more from them than you do from others. This is a sneaky little thing that we do sometimes to the people in our life. It's like, well, I'm not going to make you pay, but I'm going to expect some things out of you. And you better treat me nice because you know you owe me. I'm not going to say it out loud, but you know you owe me. No, let them off the hook on that. Don't avoid or be cold to them. The secret, subtle little things. Don't cut them down in front of other people. You're like, well, that's easy. That's gossip. I know, but we've got all these ways that we let ourselves off the hook on this one, don't we? Well, I've got to warn you about Bob. Make sure you don't trust Bob because Bob and I had this situation. And I'm just telling you this for your good, not to spread gossip. Or I need you to pray for me and Bob because me and Bob have had this issue. Right? Like that's the way I was taught when I was growing up in the church is you make it into a prayer request and then it's okay. Mm -hmm. we got all these things that we do. It's like, no, I'm just not going to talk about it. Done. Don't replay your memories of the wrong in your mind. Sometimes we just fester on it and we relive it in our mind over and over and over again. And we don't even know why that we do it, you know. And sometimes we keep replaying the tapes. And part of the reason that we replay the tapes is because it, again, makes us feel righteous and superior because they did the bad thing. And we want that to be on the reruns list because it makes us feel superior and righteous. Let go of your righteousness. Let go of it. Jesus was the only righteous person. Even when you want to do good, evil's right there with you. So let go of that. And sometimes we want to replay the tapes too because it, it helps us feel okay about sticking it to them next time. Don't replay the memories. And pray daily for them. Pray daily. This is the one really ultra positive thing that Jesus gives us to do. So God, Bob, that guy I hate, be with him. No, no. How about, how about a prayer like this? I've got a prayer for you on the screen here. What if you prayed this daily? Dear Lord, what I've done against Jesus is actually really big. What they did to me is so much smaller because you forgave me, I'll forgive them. What if you just speak the truth to the Savior? And what if you do it every single day? And what if you bring Bob before him and you compare Bob's sin to your sin because there's no contest? And that's what, that's what Jesus went to. He, some of you guys know the parable. He went to this, this servant that got, got forgiven for a tiny little amount. No, for a massive amount. Sorry, made backwards. He got forgiven for a massive amount from the king. And then he went to somebody else who had this tiny little debt with him and he just decimated the guy. And Jesus is like, you've got the comparisons all wrong. So what if we fixed it in prayer every single day? That person that you're most broken with right now, what if you prayed this prayer to Jesus and you meant it? 
and you pray it every single day, and you pray it for six months, or you pray it for nine months, what's going to start to happen to your heart? Do you start to see the shift that starts to shift back again? Because that's what he wants for you. Jesus is a peacemaker, not just between you and God and your eternal salvation. Jesus wants peace now. Somebody say amen. Jesus wants peace now in all of our relationships. It's what he wants for us. He came to give it to us. Some of us struggle with the Bible. We talked about this last week. It's like, well, what what do I get the Bible for? If all I got to do is receive Jesus and I'm going to go to heaven, then why do I got the Bible for? Is that to tell me what my sin is so that somebody points a gun at me and says, if you do this wrong, then you're going to go to hell? No, that's religion. It's wrong. You are saved by grace through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God so that no one can boast. It's the anti-Pharisee plan. You're not to be a Pharisee relying on your own righteousness. Saved by grace, amazing grace. You will sing the praises of God for all eternity that you were saved through nothing that you did right. Then why have a Bible? Why have Proverbs? Why have all of this stuff? Because Jesus wants eternal life in your life now. Jesus doesn't want to just uh, resurrect you someday. He wants to resurrect your marriage today. He wants to resurrect your family today. He wants his word, his life to come into all of these things. Can I ignore it all and still go to heaven? Theologically speaking, yes, you can. That sounds weird to say. Because most of you won't. The scripture will also tell you that. But you will not earn through following his ways, any more of your way to heaven, you won't earn it. And so Jesus gives you his advice as a gift. He gives you his commands as a gift, his truth as a gift, and said, do it this way, and you'll find peace in your relationship. C.S. Lewis wrote a book. It's called The Great Divorce, and it's the divorce between God and man. I was reading this book. It's crazy. And the book is essentially C.S. Lewis trying to exercise his imagination on what might hell be like. Have you ever wondered what hell might be like? Big topic. So Lewis asks that question, and it's not a biblical book in the sense that he's not using verses. He's just exercising his imagination. And he says, maybe heaven is a place where we go and we say, God Let your will be done. And maybe hell is a place where God comes to us and says, you go ahead and let your will be done. And maybe that's what hell is. And then he goes a little further and says, what if if those of us who reject Jesus' plan for us, we set up that boundary with God and said, no, we don't want it. And and God says, fine, then you'll, you'll decide your own destiny. And, and maybe God places us in a place with, with others who have made a similar choice. And, and, and Lewis imagines that God gives us a power to build our own house there. And we can build our own house any way that we would like, you know, and any style that we would like and is big and, and you know, gold-plated everything, whatever, whatever you like. He's like, and you can place your house wherever you want it to be placed. And you just get that power in hell. And he's like, then what happens, what starts to happen is people can't get along with each other and they can't reconcile anything because the love of God is left. And so what they do is they used to live next to each other and then they move their house a couple, couple houses down the road. I need a little more separation. And then a little bit longer, they need a little bit more separation. And he imagines that because of that, Hell just keeps separating its relationships and its homes, and it just keeps expanding and getting wider and wider and wider and wider apart until you have everything that you want in your house and you have no people to enjoy it with. Oh, that's a dark picture. I don't want to end on such a downer, but could we be honest that if we were left to our own devices what we would do is we would break and separate so much. And Jesus has a better plan. It says, no, I want it to all come back together. Now I want everything to reconcile. 
Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the parents who know their kids and get to see them. Blessed are the grandparents who get to see their grandkids and open gifts with them on the holidays because it's not so broken yet. Right? Blessed are those who, who, whose family doesn't want to leave as soon as they possibly can. Yes? Blessed are the peacemakers. I was thinking about Jesus this morning and thinking about the kind of peacemaker that he was. And, and again, not just on the cross, even though that's the center of our faith, but look at the kind of peacemaker Jesus was. Anytime something broke, he went after it. Do you notice that about him? Peter breaks and denies him. Who does he go after? He goes after Peter. We talked about that at Easter, man. He just goes after him. And what's he doing? He's like, no, I'm not going to let you separate down there. I'm bringing you right back here. And his brother James grows up not believing in Jesus because how could you believe your brother is the son of God? Of course. But after the resurrection, Jesus goes to James and appears to him. Post-resurrection, James believes. And they resurrect that, that relationship between the two brothers. And it's an amazing story. And Jesus is always, always, always doing that. He's always peacemaking. He's always putting it back together. And I think about this church. And I think about, I think about people that I can see in the seats this morning. Many of you. There were problems in our relationship between me and you or, or you and somebody else and you were a peacemaker in this church. And God was just flooding me with faces and with names during first service and saying they were a peacemaker and they were a peacemaker and they were a peacemaker and they put it back together again and Jesus is glorified in that. Is Jesus glorified in that? Yes, we see him every time a relationship that's broken comes back together again. Thank God for you. Thank God for my wife. Oh my goodness. All the people that have been peacemakers in my life. All the people that inspire me to do it more. I'm going to ask you a question right now. I'm going to pray a prayer. We don't do this very often, but I'm just, just I feel like God's in this today. I'm going to ask you to stand in a moment and because I'm going to pray a prayer and I want to pray, pray over those of us who want this prayer and, and I want to give you a chance to stand up and I want to give you a chance to respond. You're not going to have to come forward and we're not going to count you or any weirdness like that, but it's just I want to give you a chance to stand and just kind of declare to the Lord on behalf of your family where you're at. And if there was something in this, this message this morning where you felt like the Holy Spirit was speaking to you and saying, this peace was for you. You need to bring this into your family to bring peace. I want you to stand right now. If the Lord was saying that to you, I want you to stand. And you may be the only person in your family that stands today, and that's okay. And you might stand for them. You might stand for all of them. And if God would speak to you and say, I want to be a peacemaker in my marriage in a different way, in a better way. Maybe you want to stand today. You say, God, I want to be a peacemaker. You've, you've been stirring that in me. I want to be a peacemaker to my kids because we've been broken. I'd ask you to stand today if that's your prayer today. And there's something about There's something about telling God in a physical way that I'm in this. There's truth in it. Let's pray. Jesus, God, we pray for a resurrection spirit in all of our relationships. God, I hold up all the marriages in this room. Those folks that are online with us, Lord, who we love, God, their marriages, God, the kids, the extended family, the friendships that are broken, Lord, we hold up all of it. Could we have the attention of heaven on it right now? And Lord, in any of these places where we've added to the brokenness, where, Lord, we've poured the gasoline on the fire, God, I pray that, God, you would help us to find a new way and a new pattern. Show us, Lord. 
And God, as soon as we ask for that, that kind of power, Lord, we start to doubt right away about whether or not it could ever be different. So Jesus, I ask for a clean slate today. And I ask for forgiven sin today. Help us to be done with the past today. And Lord, I pray for a new pattern to be built and I pray that you would build it by the power of your spirit. And I pray, Lord, that we could trust you today. Bring healing, Jesus. So much healing all across this place. In Christ's name, amen.